I'm going to introduce to the stage an incredibly inspiring. <laughs> I, um, I, in my head, what we were gonna do was the dirty dancing move. Oh. <laughs> but then I realized halfway through, if one of us committed to that, one of us will 100% get injured. Um, Hello, Ben. Bear, everybody. Hey, everybody. I've written my questions down on a piece of paper that I printed. Uh, I'm going to place I've them. I've memorized my answers. Oh my goodness! I'm off book for today. Really? Yeah, yeah. This is very exciting. Uh, we're thrilled to be here. Thrilled to talk to you, by the way. This is this will be a real conversation that we get to have. We haven't had. I mean, we just had one, which was great. But we just redo what we did there over here. I agree. This should be a real conversation. Okay, great. <laughs> Spit take immediately. Um, How big is this split? Woo! How many people do you think are here? Can you uh, can you turn the audience lights on just for one second? Because Stephen needs to stare every single person down before him, just so he knows how many people are here. This nice. is good. Hello. Beautiful. Uh, I'm going to start the uh, I'm going to start the interview off with um, you get to be interviewed. It's very exciting for me to be the one interviewing you. Uh, I don't oftentimes get to see you on the other end. It's not supposed to be funny. Yet. It's not supposed to be funny. No, yet. no, but I just love that is true. Like I I always have to be the person interviewing the other person. Yes. yes. Yeah. Does it feel uh, exciting or, or more stressful to be on this end or no? Uh, you know, I'm a great guest. Oh yeah. <laughs> I could tell. The, uh, the Colbert Report, the thing was, is that the guest wasn't the guest. Or the Colbert Report, I was the guest. Yes. That's why I would go from the desk to the interview area, and I would get the applause, and I would take the bow before it ever started. And, and I loved that. It took me a while to figure out at the new show, oh, no, no, that's the guest. Yes. You almost have to, it's almost like annoying to let them talk sometimes, right? When you're on. Of course. <laughs> My question to start this off is, if you could, uh, you've been interviewed many times, what's a question that nobody's ever asked you that you wish they had asked you? What's a question you always wanted to answer? That is my first question. What's a question you never got? But take it then, by the way, take a drink. This uh, interview is sponsored by I will water. tell you a question I have been asked before. Okay, so that's not what's the What's a question my... that you've never been asked? Great. That you wish that somebody had asked you? Okay, we're gonna get to the next question. You guys ready? <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not that fascinated in me, so I don't anymore. I mean, right. When it was a better reflection in the mirror, I could stare there for hours. Oh my God, oh. I can't even imagine. Love is a full length mirror. Oh but my goodness. Can you imagine this in a full length mirror? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, you need IMAX to capture my hips at this point. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris uh, Nolan's the only one who's ever filmed you nude, they say. IMAX. They say. They say. <laughs> Understood. I'll send you some links. <laughs> but uh, no, is that I, I'm happy to answer any question about me, but I don't actually think that much about what people would want to know about me. Like the, the story Great. I would the th story I would like to tell. Okay, I have so a bunch I'm, of I'm up for whatever. Great. So my first question is: as I've grown older, and I don't know if it's similar to people here, I find myself wanting to connect with things from my past, mm. not just memories or moments, but like actual things. I'm finding myself collecting old Nintendo games that I had as a kid. Are there things from your past that you find yourself either collecting or wanting to go back to as you've grown older? Fuck, that's a good question. <laughs> My God, and we're starting like this? I'll tell you some things that I would love to be able to find and recollect it were the first sketch scripts that I wrote. Oh yeah, when sure. I was, when I was writing sketch professionally, but they're all on floppies. You know they're on that little click, that little little click door. Absolutely, click I know door the floppies. click door. You get it in nuts. And I, out. Ha I have uh, an old like Mac, three 
3100 laptop or whatever. Right. Like before, this is a laptop from before um, Steve Jobs came back. <laughs> okay. And made it a good company again. Yeah, yeah. And I can open it and I can get it to start with the power cord. It'll start up and boot everything, but you can't touch it. Or else it'll shut off. It's like a and TNT I, and device. I, and I try to, what did you say? It's like a TNT device when someone's trying to like rip apart the red wire there, or something There like is that. no wire you can cut and not blow oh. up. And, <laughs> but if I don't touch anything, if I don't touch the power cord or the top or anything, and I'm, I've been trying to snap one of, those, one of those old floppies in there to see whether I could see because I think there's something I wrote when I was young that was good. Can I tell you, a technology exists to take, I can get you an external floppy drive. <laughs> no, you don't understand. You're actually seeing me learn in real time. Oh, I can do it. You can I actually... literally, I mean, I, be, I feel like we're close enough friends now that I will get, if you... We weren't when I walked on, no, but, but now, now I really feel... They feel it. Yeah, I mean, everybody sees. Laughed. We okay. know where this is going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it wasn't Passover, we'd be going out to dinner. Oh, um, and happy Pesach, everybody. Yes. You know what I mean? Is it happy? It is happy. You're for supposed now. to say happy. I think it's a good Pesach. <laughs> right, 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 okay, right. Yeah. Um, How is it happy? It's good. We'll see. Um, I can I can help you out with that. I'm literally going to help you get. I'm going to get your old scripts back. I just turned a profit on this interview. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Look I mean, at that. it's amazing. I'm making money. Um, Anybody want to buy a 30 year old not that great script? Oh, and throughout... Because I'm about to have a bunch of them. Throughout this, yep. uh, Stephen's going to try to pitch as much stuff, try to sell as much old stuff that you have in your storage container. That's what this is mostly about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those scripts would make you happy. That would, that's I would love to go back and read that stuff. The stuff that I thought I was, that was good when I was like 27. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, um, this is the life portion before we get to the work portion because mm -hmm. the work portion is going to be just absolutely hard-hitting questions. Okay. Do you know what I mean? It's good. No nonsense stuff. Um, is there a way you reward yourself after a good day? <laughs> what I do sometimes is have a cheeseburger when I've done something well. Is there something you do go out, a food item or something you do with your wife there that is like, a you thing, celebrate? There is a thing that I do. It's not so much... There, 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 I have indulgences. You okay, know, I love I this. give in. When I was a young man, younger than you, if Come that's on. Possible. Come on. With that hair? But when, when I was a young man in my 20s and had zero money, the two things that I wouldn't skimp on was I liked a starched white shirt. Oh, I dry cleaner. A, I liked a crisp, laundered shirt, and, and I wouldn't deny myself buying a book. Those were the two things that I would not. If there was a book I want to read, I'd buy the book. Because I thought, like, I'm going to use that somehow. I'll use that knowledge. I, I shouldn't deny wow. myself a book. Now, if. If you can afford all the books in the world. Right, but I, and they're all on my watch. <laughs> they're all on my watch. Uh, there's a pizza place in New York. Okay. That if I have had a rough week or a rough run, like if it's the end of a long yes. run or something, it's that Friday, is that my assistant would say to me, Lazar's? And I'd go, yeah, Lazar's. It's in the 30s, and it's cracker thin, and it's square, and it turns up the edges, and it's charred. Oh, the come ingredients on. ingredients are fantastic. And it's not huge, but there are one, two, three, there are eight squares in it. And what I want is for the pizza to be given to me, to be put on my desk, like a Diet Coke or something, yeah. and then don't talk to me. <laughs> and don't ask me for a slice. You I don't, a whole pizza? I eat the whole pizza. What do we pizza. have on top? Just cheese or we put uh, something on there? Uh, cheese, uh, prosciutto, Ooh. and a little bit of uh, thin sliced onion. Everybody That's look it. under your seats right now. There's an entire There's ham an entire... And, a, and a long knife. <laughs> There's an entire ham and a long knife, so you can cut Stephen. Yeah, but that's, my, that's, that's probably my indulgence. I love that. Yeah. Uh, and cocaine. Of course. <laughs> I mean, I got to do something to take the weight off from the Lazarus. Oh, my God, you can't just... Well, you're, that's you Friday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Of course. It's coke. That was the, what the Happy Day song is about, right? Friday, Saturday, Saturday cocaine Saturday. time. <laughs> Okay, here's a trivia question, Mr. Okay, first trivia question. Here Mr. we go, everybody. Mr. Hollywood. Okay. Yeah, a it's lot like of people call me Mr. Hollywood. Even though I'm from the Bronx, a lot of people call You're me Mr. Mr. Hollywood. Hollywood. Well, transplant. Yeah. What was the original theme song to Happy Days? Because it wasn't that fucking Monday, Fridays, Saturdays, Happy Days shit. The first year was none of you, him. I got it. You don't think I have it? What is it? Ready? The, the, the jukebox goes like this. It you drops. Know, the I, arm comes out. It goes it down. Is. And it goes... You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Nope. Huh? A one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, a rock. A five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, a rock. A nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the dark tonight. 
Well, the cock says, well, they did it for a We're going to rock around the clock tonight. We're going to rock, rock, rock till the broad daylight. We're going to rock, go to rock around the clock tonight. I'm the youngest of 11 children. Okay. There's, we're still on the, the, the we're still on the personal part, right? Yeah, I'll tell you when we switch. Okay, you'll see. Uh, by the way, when we switch, there's going to be a question that makes you take off your glasses. That's how big it is. There's going to be a light in your eyes. There's going to be a light in my eyes. You're going to go from dog to wolf. That's exactly correct. Because um, wolves are just mean dogs. Right. They don't have that little thing to do with their eyes like this. <laughs> <laughs> wolves don't do that. That's true. They don't. I'm the youngest of 11 children. Yes. And I remember when I was in college, my brother Ed, who's the second oldest, he's 17 years older than I am, he go, and he goes, uh, how's it going, Steve? And he goes, well, I'm feeling a little old, Ed. And I was 19. And he goes, right. oh, really? I'm feeling a little old. And I said, yeah. I mean, I just realized I remember when uh, the album Let It Be came out. Sure. Or probably Abbey Road. I remember when Abbey Road came out. And he goes, Stephen, I used my allowance to buy an original 45 of Bill Haley and the Comets, Rock Around the Clock. Oh. I'm like, oof. It's old. How's the bone density? <laughs> Your cat's my phrase, older brothers, the my, bone density is amazing. My older brothers and sisters love jokes about how old they are, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I love the catchphrase, how's the bone density? Yeah. Um, this is going to be a question on top of your buying books question. You're a big sci-fi reader. You're Love sci -fi. Lord of the Rings. Sci-fi fans. Well, Lord of the Rings is not sci-fi. That is fantasy. Of course, fantasy. Because the thing is, the people who don't read sci-fi and fantasy go like, oh, yeah, yeah, sci-fi, Lord of the Rings. Fantasy. You'll give me fantasy. I will give you fantasy. Okay, fantasy and sci-fi. You didn't ask for it. You asked for sci-fi. Well, you're right. But fantasy, you're giving me uh, Lord of the Rings would be fantasy, correct? Yeah, I would say the, it's, the, it's the source of most modern, right. like it's the thing that started modern Okay, fantasy. you don't have to yell at me. We're having an interview here. <laughs> um, I would say for, for me fantasy. How's the bone density, by oh, the way? How's the bone density? Um, for me, uh, growing up, uh, a fantasy and um, sci-fi is a manner of escapism. I don't know if it was for you when you were a kid. Oh, yeah. Okay. So for you now that you're a little bit older, is it still a sense of escapism? How do you use comfort those too? Comfort. You that's know, a, like it's, yeah. it's going back to like that's the soup I want to like. That's my childhood soup. That's the thing that I want to have again to calm me down. That was exactly like the thing that you had when you were a kid. You're trying to revisit it. It's almost like that first question that I asked a little bit ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> But for real, for me, don't you feel like, what do you think that sense is, that sense of wanting to feel what as a kid, to connect to what as a kid, uh, for you to keep reading those books and stuff? Well, there are two things. I know what you're talking about in terms of what are you trying to connect to, because I, I don't actually want to see the world through the eyes of my childhood self. That's, that, that doesn't interest me that much. Very interesting. Um, but I, I do... This is not the part where he's taking off his glasses. He's just cleaning them. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 that's not how t I'll take them off. When I know we get to the question, I won't take them off like, I won't take them off like this and go like that. There'll be a to you'll know when I take oh, off my glasses, God. just as surely as I know what the question is. Great. Um, I do get, I, I do get like um, bits of that. I get like an echo of that feeling yeah. of the strangeness of the world that I know nothing about as a child, hints of what adult life is like. And especially yeah. science fiction's got a lot of sex in it. Absolutely. And um, most of the covers of those are very provocative. A lot of them. The, the worse the book, the sexier the cover. That's right. <laughs> you know, Arthur Conan Doyle or like, you know, like yeah, Conan yeah, yeah, the yeah. Barbarian and that stuff like of that. Of course, loincloth. You know, what did you say? Loincloth. Loincloths, exactly. Frazettas, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. paintings. Um, I love that art, by the way. I have got a really good collection of astounding science fiction in the 40s and the 50s. Okay. You know, John W. Campbell was the editor. I have the original May 1950 astounding science fiction that has in it the only thing that John W. Campbell ever introduced by saying, this is not science fiction, this is fact, this is usable, you can use this information in your life. Really? Do you know what that article was? I don't at all. It was the first publication, no one had ever heard of this before, of a little thing called Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard. Is that true? I have the original publication. Of what year May, was that? 19? May 1950. And it was, it was Dianetics, A New Science of the Mind. And you read it, and it basically it's like, instead of like 200, I don't know how long Dianetics is, but it's like 20 pages. Wow. It gives you the basics. And you had the original, you have the original one. Right. Unbelievable. Yeah. I'm going to push on through so we don't talk about Dianetics too much. <laughs> 
You are. But the other thing I want, but the other thing, I'll, I'll, I'll finish, I'll answer your question. You, but we have as much no, time I as No, I understand, you want. I understand. We should move on, but. No, no, we I, don't I, need to. No, we oh, clearly do. Part, of course, we clearly of course, do, of course, obviously. Of course. But Hollywood man, we gotta move on. You okay. know, from Dianetics. Yeah. So, you shouldn't, though. Now's not the time. <laughs> and you know it. And you know it. I'm just saying, I'll put out, I'll put out ethics in on anybody else because I put them in brutally on myself. Ethics? Out ethics? What are out ethics? Read the book. <laughs> anyway. Use the tech. I'm just saying use the tech. I get it. It works. If you don't know it, learn you it. You had 11 brothers and sisters? <laughs> the feeling I get is it's, it's very comforting when I know what's going to happen in the story. That's one of the reasons why I go back and read the old books, oh, is that I know what's going to happen. Do you not like surprises? Are you one of those people that reads the end uh, or uh, no. finds out about the end of a movie before they watch it? No, I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. But I just, there are some things like, if I want to go back and read Ringworld by Larry Niven, yeah. that's great. I enjoy, the, I enjoy the sort of the game of how the story snaps together. But I also like the comfort of knowing what's going to happen I like with that. the Chilting Braun. Anyway, go ahead. It's oh, gorgeous. Fantastic. Uh, we're almost done with this section. You, I, I learned that you used to teach Sunday school. Yes, for, I did it for three years, and then I was a sub for a while, but Fantastic. I did it for three years. Uh, I'm, I'm a Jewish male, uh, good Pesach, wonderful happy Passover to you. Um, I've obviously never been to Sunday school. What's a lesson or something, uh, not even a bit, what's a lesson or something that you would impart on me that's something that you used to teach your kids or your students at that time that you're like, could work for everybody? The great thing about it, I always did, I always did second grade, because that's the year that you have First Holy Communion. Okay. And so I was there, Catechist? Is that what it's called? You know I can't answer that. <laughs> I mean, it is an SAT word. Well, I'm not saying you have to show up for mass, well, but it's an SAT word. Well, How'd you do on the SATs, by the way? Not as well as I wanted. 12-10, uh, 655-60, and I took them twice. Wow. And uh, why did everybody groan? <laughs> Also shows how you old had to have it. Like, he had a fourteen eighty just to buy a ticket here today. I went to Union. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Do you oh, think yeah. less of me that I didn't? Uh, I didn't no, no, get, no, I, I got waitlisted at Tufts. I did. I did not do well in the SATs. So, by the way, I I feel like I didn't get good at uh, being in school until I was in college, and it cost a lot of money. And I had to, we were Same I went here. to public school my whole life, Same here. and then went to a liberal arts college. Yeah. Uh, my mom is a, a public school Bronx music teacher, and then. Um, so it was, you know, and then when we went to college and it cost so much money, I have never worked harder in my sure. life. I was like, I, I know we're spending money on this. I know it's not easy. So I'm going to make people have, have proud and stuff like that. I was a young man full of promise who never uh, paid off on it, like tested very well, but never did any work. And then I got to college and I went, nah, I guess I should try. It's, that's then, what it is. And I guess I should try to see whether they were right. Oh, and they, you ended up being very smart. I did okay. What's I mean, seven academically, times seven? What? What do you mean, what? What's seven times seven? It's unknowable. <laughs> you see, I love the mystery. You open up dynamics. I love the mystery. Yeah, it's, not knowing. Uh, seven times seven could be anything. Hold on, really hold on. Think hold on. about it. Seven, that's okay, that's one. seven. Carry that's the... Seven. Okay. That's seven. Nobody seven. shout it out! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, Give him a seven. second. One, two, Give him a second. Five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's, it's in the 40s. <laughs> Barely, barely. But in it's the in floor. there. You got it. It's in there. Is there a lesson that you would throw uh, from uh, a yes. Sunday school thing? One of my favorite things about uh, teaching second graders was they had great questions. One, they would say like, the, the, the things that you know, you're a sophomore in college and you're getting high and you're thinking you're being so deep, but these seven-year-olds are going, uh, what came before God? <laughs> Good question, right? Yeah, great. And you have to go like, well, there's really no before. You know, then you have to do, you do like, uh, you do Venn diagrams of like, here's time, and here's eternity, and they do not touch, but God is in the moment of connection, like whatever, I was doing shit like that. But the story that I like, and the kids were going, go back one more time. <laughs> the second graders. Second graders. Smoking it's weed. so sad. In Sunday school. So sad. So your lesson is to But they all weed? still go to church. You did something right. Kids who didn't smoke weed, they're like, no. Um, I really love the story of the, um, of the prodigal son. Okay. You know, the, the son who like says, why should I have to work in my father's vineyard and, and like 
stick around, uh, give me all my inheritance now, I'm gonna go out in the world. And he squanders the whole thing. And basically right. it ends up living with like pigs in a gutter or whatever like that. And he's like, wow, even the servants back with my dad like can have some place to sleep and everything like that. And then he, and then he comes home. The, what I like about the story is, what it says in the gospel is, his father saw him coming from afar. What does that mean? He was always looking. Oh, wow. He was always looking in the distance for his son. And that, our relationship to God, is like that. God is always looking for you to come from, to him from afar. No matter how far away you've gone, the eyes are always on you with love and acceptance. And he comes back and they kill the fatted calf tonight. So stick around. Wow, I like that. Is God in the audience tonight? <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's beautiful. I just, I mean, I, I didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> but I delivered it. And what that's kind of the job I do every night. How's the bone density, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Say that to God. Hey, how's the bone I'll, density? I'll ask you one more life question, which connects with uh, religion, because I, I, I find that fascinating as well. And then we'll go right into work stuff. But um, one of the things that I uh, always wanted to know more of is how does someone, how do you use religion to cope with something negative? When something negative happens to you, how is it that you look at this, uh, or is it always teaching a lesson, this is why we're doing it, or do you look at that differently throughout your life if anything negative or something like that happens? Um, that's a really big question, man. Guys, I'm not fucking around here. <laughs> is it too much of a question? I should ask you, what's it like to fart? There's similar that answers. Was question. There's, similar an question. There's similar answers. <laughs> similar there's answers. similar answers. If you want to answer it, I'd no, love I'm, to no, be. I'm, 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 literally, there's no, nothing I don't want to answer. Um, it's such a big question that I want to give you. Uh, it's something that I find difficult. I want to give you a good answer, and I don't want to give you a pat answer. Like, you know, I don't want to go to Sunday school with you right now. Um, I don't Wait, know. What does pat mean? Pat, what? Mean, uh, when you say pat, pat means uh, a prepackaged. Oh, got it, got it. A prepackaged name. Not It's Pat, the 1990s SNL character. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. Okay. Okay. That's right. Thank you very much. That's right. Is Pat in the audience tonight? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, what is it? I oh, ask because I have. Well, you know, I have for the like. Basically, you're talking about you know in the in the darkness. You know, <laughs> in light of the darkness. In what? How does your religion? How help do you, you justify religion for something? When oh, that's yeah. different. How do oh, you sorry, justify no, 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 in the darkness, religion? In, in the darkness. No, no, no. no, 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 no but no, you're no, saying no, how do you justify religion? My you're like, how can there be a god if bad things happen to good people? I understand. In which case, I will answer this. No, I want you to answer the first one. I want you to answer the first one. No, no. It's too late. No, you're. I'll go back to the first one, but the second one first. Okay. Okay. The second one. Because it'll get us there. Are By you way, familiar? This is going great, are everybody. You, I'm having a good time. Do you know what these are usually like? This is going great, everybody. What are they usually like? I don't know. I've only done more for Parks, and it was awesome. I don't know why I said that. Who'd you do it with? We did it with the whole Parks and Rec. I was on a television. Oh, they're great. Park. They're yeah, wonderful. They're great, yeah. um, uh, there's a, do you know the play JB by Archibald MacLeish? No, but I have a question about poetry that I skipped. Keep okay. Going. So. I did I inflict, I inflict so much fucking poetry on my staff. I know. That, you know this? Well, I know that you inflict poetry on people. I inflict poetry on people. And um, so Archibald MacLeish, um, who famously wrote Ars Poetica, the last line of which is, a poem should not mean but be, which I absolutely love. Um, he has a poem called JB, which is a verse version of Job. Okay. And basically, Nick, uh, Nichols is given, Zuss allows Nichols to take everything away from Job until he's, his family's dead and his property is all gone and he's covered with boils and he's like lying on this dung heap. You know, he's got nothing left and his friends are saying, you know, curse God and die. Why won't you like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Sure. You're familiar with the story. I am not, but I'm learning for the first You don't know Job? No, I'm happy I Passover. Him. I haven't met him, but I, I've heard, I know of him. I know of him. Of him. He, so, as Nichols comes back to God, basically Satan comes back to God, and, and God says, so how's it going down there with, uh, with Job? And the verse is, Nick, Satan says, I heard upon his dry dung heap that man cry out who cannot sleep. If God is God, he is not good. If God is good, he is not God. Take the even, take the odd. I would not sleep here if I could. But for the little green leaf in the wood and the wind on water. So, 
The beauty of creation is what is sustaining in the darkest times, and the gratitude for your existence is the things that gets me through when nothing else works. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, just use the tech. <laughs> just, it's there. I literally just have to read it. Golden ticket, always there. Are you ready for the work portion? You tell me. <laughs> Are you ready for the answers? I can't wait. Okay. Uh, 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 I've read, uh, I knew about you before, but I tried to do a little bit more research before doing these questions. That's One really of the nice. I read was um, you were a dramatic actor. You, you I was. Put yourself towards a I drama. went to Northwestern University's theater, School of Speech. Yes. Yes. And then uh, what I've read, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is that you started to get pushed into comedy. People were telling you you should do this, and you're like, hell, I might as well do this. People were employing me. You were getting paid that way. I was getting paid to do comedy, and I, and I, was, I was being cast in drama. I was being cast in, you know... In uh, drama. In your drama, in a lot of uh, <laughs> black box, you of know, course. bare metal. And, the, and Chicago's great, because it's not that... Ex yes, Chicago is here. One... Two, I had, three. I had, uh, you know, because in Chicago you could, me and my friends could go put up a show. I know. It's and in like a, in a storefront that was abandoned, we put up mattresses in the windows and like spray painted black and put some chairs in there. And the Chicago Tribune and the Sun Times and the Reader would come. Wow. You know, the same people who were reviewing Goodman or Steppenwolf yeah. were reviewing our little thing that we. That's amazing. Came and I had a friend named Dex Bullard, who was a wonderful director in Chicago, and he used to call me up and say, "Do you want to get in trouble?" And what that means is, I, I learned over the years, because we did this a bunch, what that meant was, because no one would hire him to be a director and no one would hire him me to be an actor. Right. But we really got along beautifully. And he, that meant he had found a space, often it was a, an existing space that was, going, that was between shows. And they were building the set for the new show. And we had to do our play in their, on the set they were building. Yes. <laughs> and they were happy to do it because we'd like split the box. Yeah. And so they got maybe some money while there was no production in there. And usually we only had two weeks to write it, rehearse it, perform it, and then get the fuck out of there. We had to be gone. How many two performances weeks. do you think you got? We might just do one or two weekends. That was it. Really? And, but we kept on doing it. And when he said, like, do you want to get in trouble? That's what it meant. I love that. That, we had, that means he had already named it. We didn't have a play yet. He would name the play. And we would have to back the play into the name. <laughs> oh, without jackknifing, you know, the 18-wheeler the of our talent. And, and... And it was wonderful and panic-inducing, and we did it, and we got pretty good reviews. And, and that got us more work, you know, because we could, like, hear our clippings or whatever. Yeah. But we were just yanking this stuff out of various holes on our body <laughs> and having a great time. And also, I, <laughs> was, I tell you about when I was working on a show called Exit 57. Yes. the first show that I did, first TV show. We thought if we worked 24 hours a day, the show would be better. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I learned from Dex, which was before that, when we were doing theater, was that he goes, it's hubris to think that if you rehearse for two, mo for two months, it's gonna be better if we rehearse for two weeks. That was his theory. And I don't know if it was entirely right, there's a happy medium in there, but two weeks in, we kinda knew what we were doing. Really? And, we would, and, 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 and we'd do a couple a year, you know? I, I, I love that. I have so many questions about improv stuff just because we both came from the same world, but, but is there a dramatic role that Let's say uh, you had, uh, for any reason, six months off from The Late Show, a year off from The Late Show. Do you still have something in your bones that's like, man, I would love to play? You know why I asked this? I saw you and Denzel and you do Shakespeare when Denzel was on, and I was like, oh, this guy is having the time of his life right I was. now. I was. And I was watching you, and you started doing it, and then you saw his re the, one of the greatest actors of all time yeah. being like, home, where is, how does he, is there, is there a role that if, that you still want to tackle or do or you dreamed about as a younger I mean, those, performer? I mean, I was purely acting up until I had The Late Show. Of course, even when Colbert weirdest, before. One of the weirdest things about taking the job is, you know, my, my manager, James Baby Doll Dixon, when he said, hey, it's, gonna be, it's you. And I went, me? Yeah. And they said, yeah, do you want to do it? And I'm like, James, I, I'm an actor. Like, if I do this show, it's the first time in my life I wasn't inhabiting a character. Like, all the time. And, and he goes, yeah, you can be an actor anytime. No one's ever going to offer you this job again. 
And I went, oh, that's kind of true. This is, uh, then, I, then it seemed like an adventure to me. Like, oh, that's something I've never tried before. That seems really hard. Playing yourself felt, felt like an adventure. Kind of. Right, right, right. It did. Well, not only that, but the person you are ends up having to fill up all the spaces of the form. It's not just being yeah. yourself. How does that influence? Absolutely. How does being you influence all the other things that you will do and interview people and stuff sure. like that? So that was kind of an adventure. And then I'm like, wow, that's, I mean, the last thing I thought I'd be doing is something harder than the Colbert Report. Right. And he goes, it's going to be easier. And he has since apologized. <laughs> it's of way, course. Way fucking Cause harder. Because you could always go into your character when there's a dead well, air. Well, if you're doing the character, because the character was this, you know, slightly larger than life, um, what do we call him? A, a well-intentioned, poorly informed, high-status idiot. Oh, I love and it. So, and I would explain that to the guest every night. And when you were doing that, everything you did had a base coat. It had a primer coat of comedy just when you talked. And then there were jokes built on top of that that were related to sort of the Bible of the character. This is a totally different thing. So, which I'm so glad I did, because it has been an amazing adventure. Yeah. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But I was always an actor. And so in my back of my head, I'm like, I wonder if I'm ever going to do that again, because I did that for 30 years. So is there a role that you're like, man, I'd love to I'm too to play. old for the role that I've always wanted to play. What is it? This is it. This is an exclusive. Uh, uh, this is exclusive. What but, is I'm, but I'm definitely, I'm not like fishing for anybody to cast me. I can't do it. I really you want to play the boy from E.T.? <laughs> <laughs> what was his name? Elliot. 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 What's his name? Just, there you go. <laughs> Ouch. That's right. Ouch. No, I kind of wanted to play, I've always kind of wanted to play uh, Richard Rich. Not Richie Rich. I get but it. But Richard Rich, who is uh, like a protege of Thomas More in A Man for All Seasons. Oh, Robert wow. Holt. That or now at my age, I might be able to play a character called the Common Man, who's in the play but not the movie. Oh, and wow. they always cut him out of the plays when they do it. But I don't know why, because I love, I love it. Matter of fact, Mulaney and I connect John on Mulaney. John Mulaney and I connect on A Man for All Seasons so much that in my phone when he calls or texts, it says the Common Man. Oh, that's amazing. Because we've talked about how his shame. What is my name on your phone? It just is your number. Right. <laughs> so you have to see if it's me by scrolling up every time? Yeah, it's Ben. Okay. Yeah. So like, how yeah. many more of these fucking things do I have to do for you to save my name on your phone? <laughs> One or two? my phone. Honey, are you far away? Hey, Throw me my phone, I'll put it in. Just the numbers. I'll right. make up. I love the names you put into your phone. Like Conan in my phone is Pale Male. <laughs> That's perfect. I told, I told Fallon. That's perfect. I told Fallon on hit my phone. I said, "Oh, in my phone, you're Steve Allen." Because Steve Allen was the first host of sure. the Tonight Show. I said, "You're Steve Allen." He goes, "Oh, in my phone, you're Byron Allen." <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So uh, I've found I've I've been fortunate enough where I've um, we both kind of did. I, I wrote this down just so I didn't mess it up. Uh, but I did uh, improv, and the way that I started doing improv in Upright Citizens Brigade is I interned for free classes which I heard that you did as well. Didn't you do some, not at UCB, but at Second City or Improv Olympic or Annoyance? I worked in the box office. Yes, in order to hopefully I had make been, way through. I had been you know, a theater student at Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. and, and then, and, and I had also started doing this thing called the Herald Improv, which at the time was That's fairly, how I started. fairly new. Mm -hmm. And it was Dell and Sharna, Dell Close and Sharna Halpern were doing it at this little club called Cross Currents underneath the Belmont L. Like during the scenes, it would be right over. Oh, it was I was literally it. under the L, and I saw that and saw amazing people like Dave Pasquazi were the, one of the first people I saw up there performing, and I went, oh, I want to be that person. I don't know why, but something in my body just some some light switch went on. I went, I have to improvise. I don't know what are they doing up there. They're improvising one act plays, and there's there's structure to them, and they're funny, but they're also meaningful, and 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 they don't know how it's happening either. Which yeah. is what I love about it. Yeah. When it was going right, like when it went really well, like, who the fuck did that? And it's like, magic. We don't know. It's a magic. It trick. was. It, like, you know, Dell used to like take out his pentagram and put it on his t shirt and go, it's not, <clears throat> it's not you talking, it's the universe. And oh. I loved, I, I'm a sucker for a guru. And so, what was the question? Acting? 
But I, had, we improv? I hadn't even gotten to the about question. Improv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Really that we both said that with the, the, my, my question was. So I fell into that because I worked in the box office. Yes. And everybody looked down to Second City. Was like, that's not real improv. And then I worked there. I went, no, no, no. They're just doing something else with it. Yes. They're they're creating something different with it. I have found that from my time at I've been lucky enough to play bigger venues now. But at my time at UCB, it was like a 90 person in New York. It, Upright Citizen Brigade. It was a 90 person venue, black box theater. At the beginning, nobody was coming to our shows. It was me, Adam Pally, Gil Ozeri, and uh, we loved it so much that I would do the garbage there, and then when everybody left, we'd ask the manager if we could just improvise for no one on the stage that Amy Poehler was playing with, stuff like that. That's fucking great. That's Amazing. exactly the spirit. That's so That's we, exactly for the spirit. nobody. But in my head, still, even though I've been able to play these legendary venues, I find the beginning. A lot of talk about how great, how great the venues are that you play. <laughs> venues, I don't want to name them. No, but I find. Do you play Radio City? I played Radio City Music wow. Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you doing Royal Albert Hall? I'm playing the point? Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I find no, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Are you gonna count the holes? <laughs> I'm gonna try it. Yeah. Um, I found that. The time I had in those 90 person theaters when nobody was showing up were some of the best times in my life. Sure. Like, of course, and I have all these memories of moments and in shows and with people. Do you remember some scenes or something from the very beginning? Some of my best sets cared? ever were in rehearsal. Exactly. No one ever saw them. Who were you playing with back then? Because I don't think, you, were you doing stuff with Krell back then? No, right? No, no, no. Krell was. I mean, in sort of like that world of Chicago improv and then at Second City, yeah. he was like a year and a half or two years ahead of me, you know what I mean? So he Got kind it. of established himself he was the a little before. Statesman. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was, um, he was sort of ahead of me in that process. Um, I don't know, it was me, Farley, Chris Farley. You were in a group of Farley? Oh yeah. Your guys' energy would be so incredible together. We, yeah, we, we toured together. We and would you do sketch and States. improv or was it mostly sketch? We would do both. I mean, we, we always wanted, we always, when we were on the road, when Second City wasn't watching us, we had to do a best of, like a you know, best of Second City from yeah. 1959 to at the time was 1989. That's when I got hired, so it had been 30 years. Wow. Um, as Joy Sloan, who was the doyen of Second City, went, 30 years. That's what, because <laughs> we used the word fuck on stage one night, and you weren't supposed to do that. Oh, wow. No, clean. Even though we know that, like, Belushi was going, eat a bowl of fuck. Like, yeah, he was yeah, saying yeah, shit yeah, like yeah. that. <laughs> no, always clean. That's so, amazing. So she had a little amnesia about that. but. Um, so, yeah, Farley and I got hired the same day. Me, Farley, Paul Dinello, Amy Sedaris. Oh, my God. Greg Holloman. Do you remember Greg Holloman, who everyone saw Strangers with Candy, Principal Blackman? Great. Onyx, Obsidian Blackman. Yeah, great. Character. Great. So we all got, yeah, we were all, and there are other people, you know, at the same time that we're improvising with that were in, you know, like, a whole bunch of people. Because you were, you weren't just at one space. But the great thing about Chicago is that once you got to know everybody, you could drop in on other people's sets, and pretty much every night of the week, if you wanted to, you could get up. You know, if you weren't a jerk, like right, if you were right. a good person and a generous improviser, you, people would invite you up to at least do like switch. Like I you could love do it. something every night. I love. And then, it. and that what was great was I love I love the workout. Chicago, you know, I, I got the reps. Yeah. How do you feel your comedy has changed since improv stuff? Now that you have this show, do you feel like you bring anything from there into this? Not the idea of improv, but how your comedy has changed from then to here. You've lived a whole life enormously. Kids. Like I mean, like and I mean, so so different. I mean, the, the sort of like the major milestones have been, uh, you know, theater training, straight theater for years, then Second City, and then. From Second City, I produced a show with Paul and Amy uh, called X57 for HBO Downtown, mm -hmm. which was on Comedy Central, and then the Dana Carvey show. And then I was asked to be topical, because we were never topical. When we started off, Paul and Amy and I, who were this little, the, the three of us did everything together, our agreement was that we wouldn't do anything that had real world references or timely references. Just we an want, evergreen set. We wanted it to be evergreen. We wanted 10 years to be able to pick up that script and do it again. We wanted it all to be character behavior. Oh, wow. Until I got hired by Dana and, and Robert Smigel to be on the Dana Carvey show, and then they said, okay, you're gonna do an impression of Geraldo Rivera, or you're gonna, well, I, had to do, I had never done impressions. You're gonna do, I'm, the thing about it is that they would say to me, hey, you're gonna do, um, uh, uh, who's the who's the director who did Platoon? I can't remember. Oliver Stone. Yes. He goes, you're gonna do Oliver Stone. Uh, Dana couldn't find the hook. And so go, you have to do it. I said, Dana couldn't find the, the hook. The best person at impressions in the world. In the world. <laughs> and you have to find the hook. For can Oliver you give Stone. us your Oliver Stone? Uh, no, I can't. Got it. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and so that changed me because then I had to do topical stuff. I'd never really done topical stuff before. And then, and then out of that, I, wrote a I came out here, I wrote a show for uh, Tom Fontana and, and uh, Bob Morton and Barry Levinson yeah. called Sometimes Live, which was backstage at a sketch show, oh which my was God. fantastic. We actually wrote a part for Tina Fey, because we all thought she was great. Fey rock. Right. I'm not saying she stole it. Whoa! <laughs> what I mean is, is that it was an hour. It was an hour. It was like kind of a comma drama. They wanted an hour backstage. Wow. And um, that was a really fun. That was a that was a really fun show to to work on. We worked on that forever. And then after that, I got hired at the Daily Show, and then I started working at the Daily. And at the same time, while I was working at the Daily, wrote Strangers with Candy with Paul and Amy. Wow. And then then that went ash can after a few seasons. Stayed at the Daily, and then my show, and here we are. Went to Colbert. Do you feel the like Colbert there, Report? Yeah, you can clap show. for that. That's amazing. I mean, that's fine. I'll tell you the thing is, here it is. I think, I think this might be, I think this might be in some way answering the root of your question. Forgive me if it's not. Great. I mean, I asked it 13 minutes ago. <laughs> but it's great. I recently interviewed three presidents at once on oh, stage. Oh, he radio. keeps bringing this up. Everywhere we go. No. He goes, I was sitting down and he goes, oh, that's weird. I'm used to three people sitting down. Um, and one of them has the launch codes. But <laughs> uh, none of my answers were as long as any one of their answers. They, they go like, for it. Oh, yeah. They're each, at one point in time, each of them was the most powerful man on the planet. Do you have, do you, wh I, I, I have a two-part question. Let me do just you, finish my answer. Please. <laughs> You're right. I'm not going to let you finish your question until I finish my answer. I can't and, wait. And it would just say is that, the my, question was, my career, what's it like to my, fart? Wasn't that the question? <laughs> my, my career has largely been a series of happy accidents. Oh, that's great. And they're improvisationally, their improvisation is re related because I said, yes, I will do that and try to make that fun. That's, that's how it's a related to improv. That's great. Yeah. Here we are. And here we are. Chicago. And scene. And scene. And scene. I feel like I have enough time to ask all these questions. One of the things I like to do is, if, uh, who do you check in with about a piece or something that you've done to, to see if it's good or bad? Is there someone that you trusted your whole life? Or? I mean, you have the old uh, occipital Rolodex you flip through. Yes. Like, after you do this, like, whatever, Malcolm Gladwell's 20,000 hours or whatever yeah, yeah, you yeah. made up. And then you have that, so you have to all judge your inner voice, which is hard to, it's hard to mm -hmm. get that inner voice. But, you know, I work with Paul Dinello, who I've, was hired the same day with at Second City. And Paul's office is on my floor for a reason. So uh, I know that if I really need to, I can just walk down the hall and go, is this me? That's great. Can I do this? But everybody at the show, I mean, Paul, uh, Tom Purcell, who's my executive producer, I've known just as long. He was hired in to do a different company to, at Second City, but I've known him since 1988. And uh, a lot of my staff has been with me for 18 years now. So we're all kind of, we all kind of do that for each other. And if it's really something that's tricky, I'll call John Stewart I've heard of and him. my wife, Evie. The, okay. John Stewart and Evie. And the number of times, the number of times that both of them have said, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Oh, my God. If they both go, if, 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 if Evie goes, no, I'm sure John's going to say, no, that's, that's too far. They both have the same. They both have the same kind of barometer for what would be moved beyond sort of merely fucking with process and then and 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 being a troll. Right. I feel like we're gonna move into the late show right now. I feel like. Um, oh, I take off this time. Uh, you're gonna take off your pants in two seconds. Um, <laughs> I feel like back when I was coming up, I'm, I, I love late night television. I'm obsessed with it. I was Me too. A, I was a page. I, like it too. I, I, I love it. And page for whom? Page for Letterman. I freelance when? monologue jokes. Late show or the late, late night? Show, uh, where you were, uh, you got offered or you were? I, if you finish your intro. I was a page for, I was a page for Letterman. I was a freelance monologue writer for him. It was one of my first things. Um, a freelance monologue writer. So I you were like. I in jokes every morning. You and Johnny Carson. Uh, there was one time, I think I want to say this, there was one time when I was faxing in jokes and someone told me that Johnny was faxing in jokes. Well, J Dave talked about that the night that Johnny died. It blew my mind. His whole monologue, one night, Johnny had died over the weekend, I guess, and Dave went up there and he, on the Monday he did this monologue, and a lot of the jokes were dated, but they were all pretty good jokes, and he delivered it fine, the audience enjoyed it, and then everybody said, every joke I told you tonight had been faxed to me by Johnny Carson oh. for the last, you know, Incredible. years, whatever Incredible. like that. Yeah. 
when I was there, there was quite a bit of competition with Leno and Letterman and even like, you know, all, all that stuff. It feels like now with your, with Strike Force 5 and stuff like that, that you guys all love each other, right? Yeah. I mean, why? Yeah, um, but it, it predates, it predates Strike Force 5. The late night wars, I mean, everybody has their own reasons for how they feel about their job and competition and stuff like that. Sure. And I don't blame anybody for their, their, their feelings are valid. They're their feelings. But I've always thought so few people know what it's like to do this. Yes. Why wouldn't I, wouldn't I much rather meet Fallon at that secret back room that we know in Midtown and go have a drink, which is what we do instead, and talk about today? Yeah. You know, I have, I'm lucky enough to have that with Jon Stewart, but I have that with any of them. It's, and it's the M&M store, M &M store in Times Square, Dolliver. Square, right? <laughs> Except, except, except Oliver. You hate John Oliver. Oh, well, it's the You've accent. You've always hated He's not even from this country, He's really. a nice person, but enough. Also, like, <laughs> we get it. You're Give me smart. a mic. A whole week to think of a show? You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what you said backstage. You literally said backstage. Nothing but respect. That is not true. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> you drink the rest of your water. Yep. Um, but I thought that also, that there's so few people that understand what you guys sure. are doing. It's fun. It's it one of the nice things. a fun party. When I stopped by, when I, you know, I got the, the present gig, and, and while Dave was still at the Ed Sullivan, I, I asked if I could come over and talk to him while he was still in the chair. I Letterman. Want, yeah, I wanted to still talk. I wanted to talk to Dave while he was still doing it. So it was about a week and a half before his final show. He said, sure, come on over. So I went over after the show, and he was very nice, and he let me into this, you know, his little outer office, and it was just a... a Carpet, two chairs, a table, and two bottles of water. And I brought him a present for his dog. His dog? Yeah. What'd you bring him? A glow-in-the-dark frisbee. Great, <laughs> great. And, um, and I asked him a whole bunch of questions. I just said, like, hey, let me ask you about, like, where you stand on stage and why you stand. Because this is an interesting space. It's a Broadway theater. Yeah. And Mr. Sullivan changed the shape of the stage. He actually pushed the... The, the apron way out, so to accommodate cameras. So it bites into the audience. So the audience, like down here, can't really see the audience upstairs. Like they're divided. They're two different audiences. Yeah. Way. So, like, how do you deal with that? Where do you stand? How do you relate to here? How do you relate to Paul? How far apart? Where is, I like, where can you hide from your producers? Yes. If they really need you, and he goes, oh, it's great. And he told me this place to hide. And he goes, it's great because you can hear them panicking and wondering where you are. They don't even know where you are. <laughs> And of course, my producers always say, where is that? I'm like, I'm never going to fucking tell you where that is. The panic room. There's the a, pan panic room a panic room. room. And so, but, and we talked for, <laughs> we talked for about an hour and a half that night. And about an hour into it, I said, do you, I'm sorry, I'm taking up so much of your time. Do you mind me asking you these questions? And he goes, no, Stephen, no one's ever asked me these questions before. I oh said, my God. no one's ever asked you these questions before? And he, and he said, Stephen, who would know to ask them and who would care what the answer was? Yeah. It was I a very sweet that. thing for him to say, which was like, you know, there are not a lot of people who know what the pressures are going to be here or what the challenges are going to be here. Yeah, I love this. And then after that, he, he taught me how to drive. There's an br old brass handle elevator in the building, which is how you get from the office building to the theater part because there's separate... I heard, Definitely. Laura, when I was a page there, that there's an elevator that almost took you to the Margaritaville place. Like, there's a place, like a secret way to get from... There's a place called Angelo's. There's a pizza place. Yes, that's, that's what it is. elevator does not take you there. The, but you, like, have there's to go through a secret fun thing. thing. There's another fun thing having to do with that that I'm not going to tell you, because someday I'm going to use secret. it. <laughs> someday I'm going to use it. I, I mean, can't uh, wait. if you get the gig, I'll tell you. But there's anyway. A, there... <laughs> but he taught me, it's an old brass handle elevator from 1927, when Hammerstein built the place. Oh. And, and he showed me how to drive. Because you've driven an driven elevator? I said, no. And he goes, come on. you got to know how to drive a pickup truck and an elevator. Come with me. And I drove it. Like, he drove it, showed me how to use it, said, oh, you're going to want a faster motor. They're going to go, oh, New York law doesn't allow a faster motor. <laughs> and then he, 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 he had me land it. And I thought I did a good job. And he goes, that's not up to my standards. <laughs> <laughs> every time I land that elevator, because you have to ride that elevator down to get to the theater. I sure. Go, Was that good enough? Was that good enough? Oh. And then at the end of the night, I wrote it up to drop him off at his office, essentially, and I took it out to leave the building. And I dropped him off like that, and he goes, he looked at it, and it was a pretty good landing. He goes, and there you go. Oh. He got off, and it was like somebody handed me the keys to the truck. I love it. It's like, it you're ready, good. you're ready. Yeah, well, I don't know about ready, but oh, well, not my problem anymore. <laughs> yeah. I love that story. Yeah. I, um...
I watched him before, uh, before he went on stage. I do this now. I, I wonder if I was influenced by him. Anytime I come on stage, I run on stage. When I do one of my shows, I run from wherever I'm coming off to the center of stage. That's how I start off every improv show I've ever done. He, before every show, would run uh, behind the set piece this way. and then yep, and then come back and walk up. Walk on, but the run, run first. That's right. Is there something you do before any of your late shows that you're like gets you pumped up or something? Is there something you've always done, or is there something that you just started for the late show? Uh, we I've, there are a couple things that I've always done. One is. If we finish the show, if we finish the rewrite, because we have the whole process we're trying to go into, like how the show is generated. Yeah. Like, hopefully, some of it was generated the day before, because if you if you're burning that day's candle, you're in huge trouble. Right. But and also affects the next day when you have to do the it, whole thing. If it, you're behind, you're behind for the week. It snowballs, but the monologue is almost entirely that day. But second act usually is written the day before, and then so we work on that. And then we, we rehearse it at three o'clock, and then by four, we're down in the rewrite room. Very small room, six, seven people sometimes, and we just grind through it. Like it's the hardest part of the day. Got it. Is because you try to express something in the morning, like I think it should be like this, and the, it's your job to express to the staff, like I think it should be like this. Yeah. Because people only do what you ask of them. You know, it's not their fault if they if you didn't say what you wanted, and then at, then you have to put put it in your own words, and you have to polish it and make it feel, give it mouth feel and stuff like that. And if we get that done in time, I DJ, I DJ. We turn on a little speaker and I go, all right, what, what's everybody want to hear? Come on. And we listen to music before I go in, because I have to make the turn from being writer-producer. We call it making the turn. I don't know if other people call that. We have to make the turn, writer-producer to performer. Sure. And the performer cannot think about anything the writer-producer did that day. Right, it's time to He's, perform. You know, we did the show, like I say, we did the show for each other all day which is like 49% of the joy. Mm -hmm. And there's 51% of the joy is my privilege and responsibility of then giving to the audience at home what we already did for each other today. Right. And, and so I gotta turn into that person who's just there to embody it and just be in m really much more in my body and not in my head. And so, you know, we'll, we'll put on, we've been, we're doing a lot of, you know, uh, Isley Brothers recently. Great. Un, why, why is there just an Isley Brothers Institute? <laughs> right. You know, from like Shout all the way through like Who's That Lady? Great song. Falsetto. They say the Beatles like had this huge transformation. They couldn't hold the Isley Brothers. To the Isley Brothers. Brothers. Like unbelievable. Isley Brothers Un fantastic. Unbelievable. Work, is, the song, is there a song called Work or something like that? I remember I played that all the time back in the day. Yes. Great. Um, is there a song you listen to to get yourself hyped up right before you go on stage? Or oh, no? but wait, so, so I finish that, then my, my, my stage manager comes and gets me. Yeah. I go up on stage. Anyone backstage, I have to shake their hand and say, have a good show. Really? Even if it's something walking by, like the, the, the crew for the guests, music guests or something like that, I have to shake all their hands and say, have a good show, have a good show. It's amazing, you're including them in your performance. I have performance. to say, everybody have a good Love show. It. And then the last thing is I go on stage, take some questions from the audience. I always tell the same four jokes. At some point, I tell the same four jokes. So I can get a, I can put my dipstick into the audience. Yes. And it's not, and it's not, are they a good audience? It really is like, it's not, I'm looking for the laugh. I want to know, was whatever the response was, was it together? Oh, interesting. Because then I know they're an audience. Because you can dance with a person, like an audience. I can't dance with 450 different people. Yeah. And that relationship, that rhythmic relationship with the audience, which is what you want when you're doing Absolutely. The, the what monologue or a set, if you're a, a I don't, you do stand-up? Just improv. Uh, just improv for me, too, when I was coming up. So I need to know. So I tell, I, 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 it's not really jokes, but I do four things. Some of them are just physical, but I know that what they get. And I go, oh, okay, I know the degree to which I can enjoy the energy that exists in this room. Will it change your performance in the show? Oh, 100%. Wow. And it, or ha to what degree do I need to take the first minute of the monologue and get them to be one person or something like that? It's a different calculation. And you're probably also getting people comfortable with you being on stage. That is just warming up the audience, making them feel yeah. comfortable, making, yeah, I got they you, want to be good. Me. Exactly. You know? yeah, and yeah, also, yeah. it helps set the emotional tone for them. They'll get a sense of what, what it's like a pitcher and a catcher. Like, what kind of pitches am I going to be throwing today? Yeah. Because if you don't give them that sense of your emotional state, you might throw a pitch that's harder than they were ready to receive, and then they literally make a sound like somebody with a ball buzzing by the head. They go, oh, like that, because 
They didn't perceive it as a joke. They only got the emotion of it. So will you cut monologue jokes if you feel the audience isn't where you, some of the jokes would be? Like, in, like before are, I go do it, there's no time at that point. That's what I I'm figured. not a writer at that point. Right, right, you're a performer. I'm, I'm a performer The turn, point. remember the turn, everybody? And then the last thing I do is after, after we've done over that and I take questions from the audience, which I love, I love just taking part. questions. Love it. Um, is that I turn. We won't be doing that today. <laughs> no, just, um, we, I turn to my stage manager, Mark McKenna, who is real show folk. And, and, uh, and I raise his hand and I say, have a good show to him. And he's the last person I say, have a good show to. Before every show. Before every show. Does he say anything back or just shake your hand? He goes, have a good show. Oh, I that, love it. Unless it's I a really it. fucking difficult show. If it's really difficult, like we're doing something, it's live or there's something really extreme that's going to go on, like yeah. a president is coming on or something like that. Or like the show's... Or three presidents. <laughs> we get it is that I'll say, I'll say, and how many people get this reference? I'll say, you got a stick of Beeman's? Stick of Beeman's? You got a stick of Beeman's. Is that a gum, piece of gum? It is a gum. Y'all, how many people know that one? And, and, because uh, I said it the first night of the Colbert Report, as they kind of strapped me into that desk. Oh, great. I said, you got to, you got, as they lowered me into that desk, I said, you got a stick of Beeman's, and it's from the right stuff. It's what Chuck Yeager says to his, his right-hand man. Oh, that's he goes, great. He goes, how are you feeling? Are you all right? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a stick of Beeman's? And he say, I think I might have me a stick. And so the first night, I said, got a stick of Beeman's, and Mark said, I wish I did. But he always has some Beeman's now. Really? In case I say, oh, I love you got this. a stick of Beeman's, and he'll give them to me, but he bought the Beeman's in like 2007. <laughs> Wow. So you so don't, you want, you don't it, really no, want to eat that snap. stick of beans. You don't want that. No, no, no. But, no, I, no. but I know that he has it, and that's a, that's a special thing. I used to try to do this thing. It didn't catch on. I am Jewish, of course. For those, I didn't want to drop the bomb. I am Jewish. Um, but oh, happy Passover, by the way. Thank you very much. Good Pesach, everyone. Um, I used to try to do this thing that never caught on, that when I was really going to go for it, uh, and this is a New York Deli reference, I'd say, I'm going full pastrami on this one. Because, like, Katz's Deli or some of the delis, if you get, like, a full pastrami is way too much pastrami. So I say that, and everybody's like, what the fuck are you saying? So I pastrami. stopped. But full yeah. pastrami was full my Full pastrami, yeah. Um, you're about to do a bunch of, uh, I don't want to go over too much. I'm, we're not there yet. Oh, uh, Barack Obama and two of his friends are back there. Um, <laughs> what is up, oh, dog? <laughs> He, he, likes, he, 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 li he likes that I call him O-Dog. He loves O-Dog. He's going crazy back there. That's He's insane. laughing so hard. He's laughing like crazy. Oh. <laughs> He's going crazy. <laughs> I'm bad at impressions, but the audience kind of understood what I was doing. You're about to do some, I saw you doing long form uh, in, uh, uh, interviews, and I loved it. I love the idea because I sometimes think uh, for someone who worked in uh, late night and also someone who's I've been on quite a few shows the idea is you have seven minutes if you're like the second guest 11 minutes if you're the first guest or 12 12, 12. 12. we basically do 12 and 8 and now you're sitting down with people for an extended period no we're of doing time. like 20 minutes with people it's this is so fun and we'll actually like we'll actually talk to them for like 30 like I did Paul Simon recently that was 36 minutes and then five of it was a song so we did 31 minutes then we put it all we just put it all out it's so it's, fun. It's amazing. Yeah. Chandling used to always say he wished that people that did late night talk shows or interviews at all would just do the unedited version. He loved the idea of just put out, let's see what people are like when they're around each other. We do that. I love it. Do you feel like when you're doing these long form interviews, what do you do different? Do you find yourself kind of like trying to get them loose at the beginning because you have these enormous, the people you get are enormous. So it's like, are you trying to just loosen them up at the beginning and then get them to a place where they're going to be like friendly or what's the, what's the, idea? I mean, uh, I do, I do love, I do love guests who are uncomfortable. Really? I like difficult guests. I like people because like, because it's a challenge. You're like, I'm going to get well, this Well, I just, I don't know. I'm a host. I'm a, I'm a host. You're called a host for a reason. It's like you're hosting a party. That's how it started. I mean, Steve Allen literally was throwing a party after for Broadway performers. And it became a radio show. Yeah. And we're like, that was the radio show. Basically, it was like an after hours party. And then it right. became the Tonight Show at the Hudson Theater. But I love that idea that I'm throwing a party for people and I want to be a host. I want them to be, have, be comfortable. I have a bar back there. I rarely use it, but I have a bar back there. Really? If somebody wants a cocktail. I've got, uh, I got uh, Weller's Bourbon, Weller 12, in case anybody wants to give me something. Weller 12. <laughs> I've got some Everybody scotch. Everybody look under your chairs got, right uh, now. I've got Cuban rum. Cuban I've got rum? Cuban rum. It's, it's, uh, I think it's illegal. I have Cuban <laughs> rum. I think it's contraband. It's got to be contraband. It's, yeah, uh, it has to be contraband. Havana Club, Master, and I've got some of that, uh, that liberal uh, Clooney tequila. Oh, yeah, Casamigos. 
<laughs> I don't know the name. Casa Migos. I'm not into that scene. You but, don't like uh, it. You're in Hollywood. You gotta. I say gotta it. have it. Casa oh, Migos. I only drink George's tequila. Yeah. And and, uh, and then just like uh, I don't know vodka of some kind. But anyway. Do you drink after a show or no? No. I mean, I'm good at it. <laughs> Man, I heard you're great. I at got it. great at it during during COVID because I was at home and I have a of bar course. at home and was, and we'd be done at three thirty because we had to because we were shooting it on iPads and like yeah. it had to be like then sequenced and we were literally putting it out through home internet try to get it to the broadcast Unbelievable. center. Unbelievable. And you didn't even have you had dial up. You were on a fourteen four dial up modem. <laughs> yeah, fourteen four. Unbelievable. Not even twenty eight eight. No way. Or fifty six six. Mom, get off the phone! I'm doing the late show! Get off the phone! I'm doing the late show! That was kind of what it was. <laughs> yeah, it was Mindspring. That was my. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. With your Angel Fire website. What were, what were we talking about? Were we talking about something? Honestly, I'm so lost in the joy West, of sitting next questions to you. Questions or like uh, a, a long form, a long form interview. We only five minutes. Oh my okay, goodness! Okay, the long form. I have interview. So many questions. No, I just, I, I just going to be terrible. Okay. No, I love the. What I, I, what I do is I try to make a discovery because I've got the card, but I don't really want to use the card. The card is like a safety net, and it's a drag when you have to use the card. When I came on your show and I, w uh, you interviewed me, I felt that you, we went off. It this, was much like this. It was so... <laughs> One of the reasons I was so excited that you agreed to do this. It was... Especially on Passover. I know, my God. <laughs> um, and God is in the audience, right? Um, yes. but, um, but it was so fun, and I saw you light up, and we were having so much fun, Great. and I was like, uh, uh, if late night, if all late night talk shows were like this, it'd be so. But not every guest is like that, and it's not. That's right. Some fine. Some people want like, to be prepared. I mean, I, I love having Doris Kearns Goodwin on. I just had her on. It's not going to be the same as talking to Ben Schwartz. A little different. But there's a lot of love. There's a lot of love there, and I enjoy and appreciate. So I just try to see the person for who they are, and then kind of go down, like improvisationally, jump down the rabbit hole with them, and like really follow what is interesting to me about what they're saying. And then I listen. I'm a host. I want to plug the product or whatever, the, the project or something like that, that's fine, but really the discovery is so much better than an invention. And if you can do that, that's what turns a perfectly, it was supposed to be 12 minutes, and I look up and they go, that was 24. I'm like, oh no. And afterwards I always go apologize to my producer. The segment producer's gotta sure. make that into something. Sure. I'm like, I'm sorry. You know what Dave said to me? Dave Letterman, can't wait. Dave said, by the way, just go long. Really? <laughs> Let them they'll, deal with they'll it? They'll figure it out. And he goes, hey, if you couldn't get in 12 minutes, it wasn't your fault that that's who they booked. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So fun. It's true. And it's, and, and also, it's your show. I, I'll, I'll, often, I'll often find that, like, the, the lat, like, it's supposed to be 12, and we go 18. We just I don't know. I wasn't a first guest. I was a second guest. Well, we'll get there. You know what I mean? We'll, go, we'll just lose the first six minutes. That's great. Because those last 12 was like, that's where it happened. Yeah. My, one of my favorite things ever was having De Niro on, who is famously... A difficult guest. This is Joseph De Niro, not Robert De Niro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is the guy that works at your pizza place that you Exactly. Eat. This is, uh, anyway, Bobby D. Bobby D. Bobby D, the tough Bobby's guy. Bobby! He's right next to Obama. Oh, Bobby! Obama. <laughs> My man! Um, he, he's famously a challenging guest. Not difficult, because he's not hostile. It's just not kind of the thing. I think he's, I've met him once or twice. I think he's a shy gentleman, no? Yeah. yeah. He, he lives in his art. You know, he's not, he's not a jabber jaw. He's, He's not, this isn't, his, his improv is not his milieu right. like yours, but um, he wouldn't use the term milieu either. <laughs> but um, I really, I adore him. I, he's a lovely fella and I really like talking to him, but you can tell that he's there because it's good for the product or like the project or whatever like that, yes. he cares. He's doing his job. Or for, you know, the Tribeca Film Fest or whatever like that, and that's fine, they're great. But one time I had him on and I just like, I can tell he is not in the mood. And so he sat down, and I was like, how are you doing? I was like, okay. Like that, you know? <laughs> uh, good, we're getting an impression. I love it, I, I love it. Going, I was like, mm, it's good. You know, like that. You know? and, and I said, I tell you what, let's not talk. We're rolling? Is this, we're on camera? I said, let's not talk. And I said, one minute. Let's not talk starting now.
And that's what we did. <laughs> Favorite interview of all time. Oh. Afterwards, was he ready? Was he? He had fun doing nothing. Oh, I love it. Just being there. And that was that. Never, he's done a billion interviews, and I bet he's no one's never, never done asked it. him. No one no one's ever allowed him to not have to do the game. I love it so much. It was so, so fun. And then you have then there, then then there are people who are really there to play, like yourself, which is a, or like other comedians. Fantastic. Patton Oswalt is an enormous Best. amount of enormous Best. amount of fun. Brilliant. John Oliver is an enormous amount of fun. Brilliant. Of course, John Stewart's an enormous amount of fun. Tig Nataro. Tig, so I absolutely funny. love. Totally different energy. Very, almost, De, almost De Niro level low energy. Yes. From Tig. So funny. But wonderful. He immediately, the, uh, the word I use is uh, hooking up the jumper cables. It doesn't matter what the guest is like, but some people allow you to hook up the jumper cables. And then without ever communicating with the audience, you, there's a flow of energy going forth. That's right. You kind of know what they need. And yeah. They, and they know That's what you respond background. to. That's Yeah, improv. It's wonderful. I it's have, really wonderful. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time. Two more questions. Is that cool with everybody? Two more questions? You cool with two more questions? One is, yes. from, uh, one is from the Paley Fest. Uh, a Paley member question for Stephen Colbert. Uh, since the Paley Center archives and preserves the best of television, can you please share which performers or shows have been inspiring to you over the years? Oh. I mean, all it's the only one I didn't write. So if you fucking love that one, <laughs> I, I boy again, really big question. Um, you know, I love. I'll talk with like the genre I do. I really loved Johnny when I was younger. Yeah. And when I was, you know, I was still a kid for Johnny. But my mom, if I, I would, my mom would let me stay up if it was a stand up on, because she loved stand up and. And so she let me stay up for that, and then I'd have to go to bed. And that would be pretty far in, because the stand-up was never the first guest. Absolutely. So, um, you know, John Biner, David Brenner. Oh, yeah. You know, or, I mean, early, early Steve Martin. I was going to say Steve early in the Steve beginning, Martin, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Pete, Pete Barbuti. I don't know Pete Barbuti. Pete Barbuti. Oh, look him up. He played an accordion. He played the broom. He would play the broom on a mic. Great. Yeah. Love it. Uh, Robert Klein. Genius. Um, but uh, the, the person who influenced me probably, I mean, Dave, I, there's no avoiding Dave. I was lucky enough to give like the speech at, uh, when he got the Kennedy Center. I got to give him that speech, yeah. you know, that, that, that presenting speech, which was a great joy. Um, so there's no, you can't diminish the, the influence and the love that I was. I started college in 1982 when he started Late Night. I mean, we, people would come home from parties. Like, yeah. The party would stop, so people would go home and watch Dave, and then the party would start again. Yeah. That's how important he was. And... But Cavett, Dick Cavett. Sure. Because Dick was, I was, I'm not old enough, I had vague memories of the original, like with the kind of like eggshell chairs and the pop art background and stuff like that. Um, and having on, you know, Muhammad Ali and Saul Bellow on yeah. the same show or something Great like that. Great one-two punch. Exactly. And so I have vague memories of that, but his show on PBS from the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies. Ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, ba, Which, by the way, was the original theme song to Happy Days. <laughs> right? Do you know what that is, the theme, what that is from? Ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, ba, 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 da, ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, ba, 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 da. Who wrote it? Don't uh, think. Uh, Mel Brooks. Leonard Bernstein. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's from Candide by Bradley Bernstein. Bradley Cooper wrote that? Yes, he did. <laughs> wow. He's a fun guest. He is a fun guest. You can lose guess. your eyes in those baby blues, baby. I bet you can. He was my guest. He was the guest. He was my guest the night my appendix burst was Bradley Cooper. Oh, right. Didn't feel a thing. <laughs> Go uh, on. You melted. Go on. A lot of people are saying that Bradley Cooper busted up your appendix. True or false? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but uh, I've gotten to know Dick over the years, which is lovely. Like, he'll, we'll, he'll, when he's in town, we might go and have, have drinks together. I and love it. It's wonderful. He's got the best stories in the world. And they're about, like, Lunt and Fontaine. And, oh. and, and, of course, Groucho, but also, like, Brando and stuff like that. He's got the greatest stories. Heaven. Loves telling him, and that's been a really wonderful gift. And he writes me every so often. He's like, hey, I like this joke. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. Cavett's like, Cavett wrote for Jack Parr. It's amazing. Do you know how he got his joke, how he his job at Jack Parr? No. He was a young guy, you know, he was a, a student at Yale. He was from, like, the sand hills of Nebraska. And, and he w went to Yale. When he was at Yale, he used to come down to New York and pretend to be someone in show business by wearing a trench coat and having an old copy of Variety. And he would stick it under his arms, and he would walk backstage at Broadway shows because he couldn't afford the tickets. And he would watch, like, My Fair Lady with <laughs> Julie Andrews and Rex Harrison from The Wings. And people thought he was in show business because he had a trench coat and a copy of oh, Variety. Oh, my goodness. And so he, so he, then he got a job as a runner, like basically a delivery guy for yep. Time magazine. And he knew that Jack Parr like, kind of wanted to be on the cover of Time because he was like, Parr was a big deal. Yeah. And so he put a bunch of his jokes in a manila envelope and put the Time magazine sticker on it like that. And he went over to 30 Rock and he goes, I have a delivery from Mr. Parr. They said, give it to me, we'll give it to him. No, no, it's important, I have to give it to him. He didn't say it's from Time, but it said Time on it. It's like, I have to give him the delivery myself. And Parr happened to be walking by and he went, what's that? Give me that, and walked away. And he went, Is that oh. how we got to start? So we read those? He read those, and, and, and the, the, uh, he said to the woman, like, could I, could I, I'm here, could I watch the show? And they said, you can stand in the back. So he stood in the back and watched uh, Parr's monologue that night, and he did two of Dick's jokes. The first, the, the first day he got packet. it. Two of Dick's oh, jokes. Oh my goodness. And, and then the next day they got a call and they said, you can work in the audience department. And, and they, they brought him in and he basically was like an usher or like, you know, handling tickets and stuff like that. And then this is an incredible he did that story. for a few months and, and he, he was allowed to submit. And Parr went, come on kid. You, come on, you, you, come on. And they put him in, the, they put him in with the, the writer's room. And that's how he got the gig. And then he did that, and then Parr left. By the way, how long was Jack Parr the host of The Tonight Show? Bum, 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 um, bum, Well, you asked the question, bum, which means it's either shorter or longer than I think, so I'm gonna say 10 years. Four years. Really? Four years, that was it. That was how long it was the host of The Tonight Show. Wow. And then Johnny was asked to do it after that, and Johnny said, no, no one can take over for Parr. I feel like that happens every... Yeah, no one can take over for par. And then, so it was Groucho for a while and a bunch of other people, but Groucho was one of the people and that's how Dick got to know Groucho because Dick stayed, the writer stayed and they wrote for all the guest hosts. Amazing. And then he wrote for Johnny and then Johnny, then Dick was offered his own show on ABC and he's the only person who ever went up against Johnny and Johnny was fine with it because Dick came to him and said, are you okay with this? And he yeah. goes, ah, and us Nebraska boys have to look after each other. Sure, go ahead. I love it. It's great to know these people, you see. I do. It's great to know these people and because they humanize these giants who came before you and it makes you feel like you're part of a tradition. You and are a part of a tradition. I know, but you don't always feel it. Of course. You have your show you're that in the day. moment, you're not You have the show that it. day. But and you realize the privilege of being in that theater on Broadway and, and, and be able to do the show every night. You thought of it this morning, you get to do it tonight, which is related to the improv that you and I both started yeah. off with. Um, uh, that theater also, Ed Sullivan, has so much history and so much incredible sure, history. Sure, my desk is where Elvis sang his first night. It's you know, crazy. I know where the girls who were screaming were sitting. Like, we, I, you know, fantastic. They're I know, still there, I know, right? I know where this, I know where to hide so your producers can't find you. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna, this is gonna be the last question. I have, a, I have many questions that hopefully I'll ask you at a different time, but what is the last time, what, what's the, um, what's, the, what's the last time you fell in love? What's the last time you fell in love? Um, uh, what's the hardest you've laughed? Like, what's the thing that made you laugh the hardest in the past couple of years? It's a young man named Ben Schwartz. Oh my God. I can't believe he's At doing this. Radio he promised he wouldn't City do this. Music Hall. I can't believe he's doing this. He promised he wouldn't do this. No, 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 not, not related to any. Really uh, I mean, really. some of the hardest laughter I've ever had in my life, it's not like in the last couple of years, but we were flying to London and uh, for Thanksgiving or something like that one year, and Evie and my daughter were sitting in front of me, and Evie turned around and kept saying, check on your father, something seems to, is, I, I think there's something wrong with him, because I was watching Tropic Thunder, which I'd never <laughs> seen before. <laughs> and the scene at the end where they come in to save Tug Speedman, and, uh, and I, forgot, I forgot what um, Robert Downey Jr.'s character's name is. Um, but uh, it's so dumb. The is that where is the so no dumb. arms? Where he, or, oh, no, no, that's the no, so You've got hands. No, not that one. It's where they come in and he goes, like, I've, this, is my, this, is my, this is my son. He's called Twigman because he's built a little boy out of twigs. Yes. 
It isn't base. They're saying, Tug, we gotta get you out of here. And they're trying to drop character. They're trying to, they're trying to like, they're too deep. It's making fun of actors. It's yes. too deep in character. Yes. And they can't get out of character. And they have to get out of character before they can escape this drug den that they're caught in in Southeast Asia someplace. And, and Robert Downey Jr.'s character is falling through. Like he's going through all these transitions from one character to another. Like he's transmuting from one character. And he's like, you're right. I'm not Sergeant Lincoln Osiris. <laughs> and he's like, and then he takes off his hair and he goes, nor am I Father O'Malley. These are all these, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. These are all these Oscar winning yeah, roles yeah, yeah. he's done. And he goes, nor am I Father O'Malley. Then he takes off his goatee and he goes, or Neil Armstrong. <laughs> and I went, fuck, he played Neil Armstrong as a pirate. <laughs> like the backstory you saw in that one moment. And then I started choking, I couldn't breathe. I was enjoying it Neil so much. Neil Armstrong was too and that's much. When I, must have gone, I must have gone like this, I must have gone. <laughs> Every turned around and said, something's wrong with your father, check on him. And I'm like, <laughs> I couldn't explain. I'll tell you one other thing that made me laugh you really hard. You can tell hard. me a hundred things. Nobody, Nobody wants, wants to laugh hard. And this is from a long time ago. I still laugh these days, but this one, so I've, I've been hired for the Dana Carvey show, and it's like, this is the Dana Carvey show. Of course. It's going to be a big fucking deal, and it's Louis C.K. is the head writer, and Robert Smigel is the executive producer, and the writers are like Robert Carlock, who's produced all of uh, Tina's, yep. Dino Stamatopoulos, me, Steve Carell, uh, Steve O'Donnell. Is that Charlie um, Kaufman or something? Charlie Kaufman. Yeah. Um, uh, Isn't that crazy Charlie Kaufman? Uh, was David set? Cross and Odenkirk. Like, these were all people in the room writing this. And, and me, and I've got this gig, and I can't believe it. And I've moved to New York. I've already worked in New York for a few years, but I was basically commuting to do Exit 57, my first show. Sure. This is the second show, and I got a new baby. I, I got a wife and a new baby at home, and I'm like, I'm going to go to Chicago. We're going to move you there eventually, but I have to go a month ahead of time, you know. And, and we get there, and we've. We've worked on a couple of scenes already. We've written a few things that they go, well, we have to shoot these ahead of time. These are roll-ins. We can't shoot it in New York because they're outside and it's too cold and snowy, so we're gonna go to Florida. I'm like, I love, there used to be so much money in network television. <laughs> we went to shoot one sketch and we flew to Kissimmee, Florida for the weekend and shot for three days and ate like, you know, Kobe beef. It was there was crazy. We we were abusing the system. Even then. <laughs> yes, of course. But there was a system to abuse, is what I'm saying. And so I did, forgot to tell Evie that I was flying to Kissimmee, Florida. I didn't tell her. Your wife, Evie, and my wife, Evie. Everybody knows it's Evie, right? And so uh, I didn't tell her I'm in Florida. And the sketch we are going. It's part of one sketch is what we're shooting down there. And the sketch is that I'm playing this guy from the Rockefeller Institute for Animal. A behavioral study, which is a real thing in New York, of course. And so I'm playing this sort of very, you know, patrician sort of fellow like this with a gray mop of hair and sort of a very chic curl over one eye that I keep putting like, well, what we're doing is we're, we're seeing what it feels like to a horse. We're putting, we're putting a cardio, cardiogram on a horse to see what, you know, how they react if you throw them out of a plane. <laughs> Because they kind of run out of shit to test. <laughs> of like, course. What if we did that? How would that be? <laughs> and so we shot this one thing on the ground in like an old constellation with like a hatch door, but the plane is actually going to fly. We had a real horse in the plane, but, that, but the, we were like fluttering sheets outside the window. Oh. On the, so like, we're like, we're about to drop this horse. <laughs> <clears throat> and then somebody else in the production, wonderful property department, built a full scale horse. Built? <clears throat> built built like a, a prop horse. To throw out of a plane? To throw out of the plane. And it's a whole, a whole horse. And it's like beautiful, like fake fur, but it's beautifully done and combed. And there's an internal exoskeleton because Robert Smigel, who's a perfectionist, wanted the legs to move realistically and everything. So they built a fiber glass skeleton inside this. And it's a really realistic horse that had to be, they had to rent a U-Haul and they drove it all night from New York to Kissimmee, Florida, where we flew the next Don't day. Don't you dare sit down. So, <laughs> this is the last question. Do we okay. even have a spotlight? Get this man a spotlight. Away. So, so I, I'm, they're doing a test run of the horse, because they gotta know like, okay, which way is it gonna go? We wanna get a sense of what it's gonna be like, and yeah. change like the altimeter or whatever, because the, there's a parachute on the horse. Yeah. We've strapped a parachute on the horse. Yeah, keep okay. going, keep going. All right. I'm gonna sit, it's easier if I sit here for everybody. Okay, so. So, I, we have a moment to kill, because the horse, the, the fake horse has gone up in the, in the real plane to fly over this public park somewhere in Kissimmee, Florida, next to this swamp. 
Great. And, and you know, there used to be pay phones. And there's a pay phone <laughs> there, because I didn't have any cell phone at then. This is 1993, four, something like that. Okay. And, and I said, oh, I'll take a moment to call Evie, let her know I'm in Florida. <laughs> and I dial, I'm dialing, you know, put, you had to put in like a, your access code, like whatever your, your phone card was, like my thing I thought, and I see the plane coming overhead. I'm like, oh, I, I'll just do this quickly like that. So I, it, it rings, she picks up, she goes, hello? But in the time it took for her to pick up, they had thrown the horse out of <laughs> the test horse, the test run, they'd thrown the horse out of the plane. <laughs> and long enough before she picked up that I saw that that parachute was not gonna open. <laughs> It's just dropping. <laughs> the only way I could describe the way it was dropping was like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and it's dropping out of the plane. And so, of course, I, I know the story of how expensive it was for us to go down there, how expensive it was to build a... It was like a $14,000 horse. She has no idea where you are. No, no idea, idea that I'm in Florida. No idea what I'm looking at. And so she picks up, she picks up and says hello, and I'm on the other line going... <laughs> I'm shrieking. And she's like, what's happening? Are you okay? And you're like, the horse! The horse! This is a parachute! It's me! It's me! The horse... achieves terminal velocity. <laughs> you picked the perfect and the, word! And, and, the, and the, 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 the parachute was supposed to open and the winds, because they're judging the winds, was supposed to drift it over to the park. It hits that swamp at 250 <laughs> miles an hour and explodes. <laughs> the guts, the fucking bones come out of it. They have to go in there into the swamp and drag a bag of stuffing and fiberglass, oh. and they, 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 what are we gonna do? And then the jump master goes, yeah, I gotta change that altimeter. <laughs> and we're like, you think? So they ended up stitching it back up. No, you can sit, you can sit down. You can sit down. And sit. They end up stitching it back up. They end up stitching it back up, and they go, "We came all the way. We have because I wasn't in the shot. Yeah, we weren't doing it. It was a test." And so they stitch it back up, and they throw it out of the plane. But all the bones are broken. Hey, hey, what about that bone density, right? <laughs> You don't make me love you. <laughs> and, the, and the horse, and the horse went like this. <laughs> and I believe it hung like a like a sleeping cat. Oh. And I believe we changed the line to, ha, huh, sort of looks like a camel. <laughs> well, we learned that, and that's the line we flew to Florida. Three days to shoot. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Stephen Colbert. Ben Schwartz.